WP. Hello, good morning. Um, we're going to continue with another session right now. We have Empowering AR Everywhere. So please join me in welcoming um, Brian McClendon, the Senior VP of Engineering at Niantic. Thank you. So thank you very much, Lauren. So uh, actually, the title is somewhat different, and we'll get to why in a little while. But uh, you know, first off, I'm an engineer, and so I have spent you know my life building platforms, maps, and technology. I joined Niantic in 2019 because uh, John Hankey wanted me to, and our mission at Niantic is to inspire people to explore the world together. And in my case, it actually worked. I was a customer from 2016 onwards. I am level 50 on Pokemon Go, <laughs> level 92 uh, on Pikmin Bloom. If you haven't tried that yet, give it a try. And we'll talk about other games here in a minute. So at Niantic, uh, I think of AR in two different ways. We have uh, multiple technologies. Many of you are deeply familiar with this, but uh, visual AR is what you see out your screen. And it's you know, trying to align your data, your experience with what, the, what your eyeballs see in front of you and putting information integrated with that. But there's also location AR. And this is something, if you've played Pokemon Go, you're very familiar with. You explore the world. And we know where you are in the world. And we help you orient yourself, go to your next destination that's important in the game, and describe the world around you. And this, I think, is very important for outdoor games, and, and we'll get to why uh, in a minute. So some background on me. Uh, how many of you have heard of Silicon Graphics? Hey, it's a few percent of you, uh, probably based on age. Now, Silicon Graphics uh, was, uh, was the original sort of high-end 3D graphics workstation company. A lot of foundational virtual reality research was done on those, uh, on those machines. Uh, you know, a quarter million dollars for one machine, $100,000 for one eye. So to do a good VR display was $200,000 plus the headset. Um, Disney Quest built uh, many theme parks actually called, uh, you know, called Disney Quest using these uh, VR devices where the headset was like 20, 30 pounds and counterweighted, and they developed some amazing early VR experiences with them. So I was sort of at the forefront of a lot of these early technologies, and we built OpenGL there, which was one of the first platforms I worked on. After that, I joined a, uh, started a company with Michael Jones, uh, RIP, um, who... Uh, uh, created intrinsic graphics, and we built a platform called Alchemy, which is cross-platform game development for you know, DirectX, OpenGL, PlayStation 2, Xbox, and GameCube, and learned a lot about what it means to build a reliable development system that actually supports many devices and tries to take a lot of the pain off of developers. Uh, that led to a company called Keyhole, where I met John, and he was the CEO and uh, joined Keyhole in 20, 2003 and was acquired in 2004. That led to Google Earth, Google Maps, where another platform was built. We had KML and we had Google Maps API, again, trying to build something that other developers could uh, build apps on top of. And we had millions of websites and hundreds of thousands of apps that have used Google Maps, and probably some of you have used it as well. I went to Uber um, and uh, worked on self-driving cars for a year and machine learning for another year. Learned a lot about mapping as Uber needed it. And in 2019, as I said, I joined Niantic. And so this is, this is where it gets interesting. So today I'm going to talk about four things, really five. Um, and here's the agenda. First, though, I want to talk about our new game. And hopefully you know about this. I think in this room you probably do. We launched Peridot on May 9th. And it's a really cool game. And it's something that we at Niantic have been working on for five years. And it drove much of how we think about visual AR. And it, you know, the team you know, it, you know, thought very carefully about how to interact with the world. And the launch has been incredible. It's exceeded all of our internal ex expectations. And if you've used it, you know the characters are cute. And people really like to play with them. I would like to say I'm level 20 on Peridot. And my dot is, is better than all of them. Uh, just, <laughs> Um, but many people, think, uh, many people think theirs is, and they've been posting on TikTok, and we've got a huge amount of traffic with people sharing their experiences in AR on TikTok, and I think that's, that's been great for the business. So how did Peridot happen? We worked on thinking about what, what's possible on mobile phones today, 
And one of the first things that sort of built the entire game experience was this idea of semantic understanding of the world. And if you've used Peridot, you know that not only can it know where the ground is and where the walls are, it can react to objects in the scene around it and actually do some very interesting things. I think the, uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, digging, digging for food, and it knows based on what kind of surface you're on, what kind of food you're going to find. And uh, all of this is based on a semantic understanding neural net stack that is very hard to get working in real time reliably. And I think you know, we've done a very good job with it. Many other features you know, are, are being used uh, by Peridot. We have uh, real-time mapping. We have this idea of location-based augmented reality. So when you're near particular locations, the, the dot can do some different things. We also have, you, you can see occlusion with it. And this last, this last video I just love. So if you're not looking closely at the one on the right, you know, who's chasing that ball and who got it? So you can have a lot of fun with these things, and they're, they're just a great uh, avenue for creating videos and sharing AR experiences. So you know, tell your friends, this is why we do what we do, to have fun with AR. So how do we do it? Well, we've had a research team at Niantic for several years, and they, they directly connected with the Peridot team. So many of the features you saw in Peridot were originally designed and built by our research team. Just uh, recently here, um, we have CVPR happening in three weeks in Vancouver. And uh, they submitted five papers, and all five were accepted. And one of them is actually a highlighted paper this year. So in productivity terms, Niantic is three to th two to three times more productive than all of those big name research companies you might hear about. And I'm very proud of our research team and what we've accomplished. But it's allowed us to build some things and uh, capabilities into Peridot and also into our platform. Uh, things like uh, occlusions and uh, nerf capabilities, as well as this uh, ACE relocalization, which is one of our foundational technologies for VPS. And I think you know, you're going to see a lot more coming out of this team uh, over time. So read those papers when you can. Uh, they're a lot of fun for papers. So first, I'm going to talk about Lightship ARDK and Lightship Maps. So we launched ARDK in November of 2001. And in April 2022, um, we had a version two of this where we introduced the Visual Positioning System VPS. And we got a lot of use cases, a lot of uh, developers uh, built with the tools. And we got a lot of feedback about you know, how, how it's useful and what things we needed to work on. And so today, we're going to talk about ARDK 3.0. And this was built very much on customer feedback. So with 3.0, we allow users to seamlessly mix and match Niantic's unique AR features with Unity's AR foundation and XR subsystems. This means that for the first time, our developers can use Niantic's features in combination with existing AR foundation libraries. We now hook into the standard XR managers and override and extend their functionality. And this means that any project that is set up to use AR foundation can simply enable Lightship in the AXR settings and we will override any existing systems like depth, occlusion, and meshing, and add new ones for Niantic's features and services. It also means that you can follow existing documentation tutorials on AR Foundation for the basic AR concepts, and then extend them to make use of Niantic's advanced AR features. For existing ARDK developers, the migration path should not be overly difficult, as AR, AR Foundation and ARDK share a lot of common workflows. However, this is a major revision, so it's, that's why we call it 3.0. And some of the API will be different, and some patterns will have changed. We have a full migration guide as part of the release. So a couple of features of ARDK 3 that I think I want to highlight. One is, and I don't have a video for it here, is realize that we've done a lot of work with depth. And our depth is cross-platform and doesn't need LiDAR. So you can do a lot of these things on basically a much larger suite of phones uh, than other systems. And you know, in this you know, videos here, we're talking about improving the user experience for developing on VPS. So we added a remote content authoring system that brings the 3D meshes that we're building for the VPS locations around the world. We have over 150,000 of them and allows you to place content you know, remotely and set up a design and then publish it and then have players, when they go visit that location, see that content in exactly the right location. And so the ability to just drop this into the, the Unity workflows that you have 
And also, uh, to develop it more easily, we added uh, sample projects. So this uh, you know, emoji garden here is very easy to use and allows you to very quickly test out uh, both VPS and some of our other new capabilities uh, without writing any code at all. So, uh, you know, great improvements in ARDK. Now I want to talk a little bit about what's different about our VPS and also how you know, these videos here were created. You know, our, our uh, users collect scans and we integrate those, those scans uh, over time. We get them from you know, uh, Pokemon Go and from Ingress and also from Scanniverse. So for those of you who haven't used Scanniverse, in my opinion, it is the best 3D scanning tool out there and it's, and it's free. And it runs on iOS and can generate meshes both for mapping but also for collecting and creating objects that you see around you. So in this case, you know, it highlights something that we really want to talk about, which is that Niantic focuses on maps at the scale of humans. It works standing, where, you know, standing at eye level, and the content makes sense, as you can see. But most importantly for us, we're able to visually position much more precisely than other systems because we have much higher resolution data collects and I think a, a better mapping algorithm uh, overall. But the visuals you see here will become very important sort of at the, the end of my talk. So we have over 150,000 locations. But uh, say you want to do something yourself. So we have the ability for developers to add public waste spots and do the scans themselves. We'll build the map at, at the push of a button, and within an hour, you'll be able to develop an experience at your location. And this is an example where somebody basically just wanted to create this experience at, at a building, they scanned it, and they were able to create, if you look, a very precise AR experience where the camera's localized and the content is positioned relative to the building. And uh, it was all, the whole experience was developed in just five hours. So this Capability reminds me of something that I can hint at but can't talk about. That, uh, we have a surprise coming at 1 p.m. today. If you go to the Niantic Lounge, you'll get to hear a talk about ingress and perhaps something in the uh, area of VPS and ingress combined, and it's going to be really cool. So do show up there. Uh, we have a lot of other great talks at the Niantic Lounge, but that's a big one. Next, I'm going to talk about the Maps SDK. So you know, I've been working on maps for a long time and have built maps platforms. Maps for games and for localization are different, in some ways easier, in some ways harder than other people who've done maps in the past. We, we've been using maps on Pokemon Go for over seven years, and uh, we have maps, I think, in all of our games, and that ex uh, experience has taught us what we need to do to make maps available for third-party developers. So uh, in the last month, we've launched our Maps SDK, and it's now available for both 8th Wall and for Unity. And this means you can drag and drop a plugin into Unity and visualize a world-scale map where we handle the t uh, tiling and serving, and we provide you a vector definition and, a rent and control over how the maps look so you can customize it to what you need in your application and uh, make this with the, with the mindset of what is needed for AR. So it's really about how do humans orient themselves in the world. You know, if you, th if you think about dropped into a location on a, a city street corner, you really want to know where to look and where the next thing you're supposed to go to is. We have built so many games and had so many users walk through our environments. Now this is going to be available to you both on 8th Wall and in Unity. We have a couple of apps that, uh, that have already built it in. So Skatrix was an existing virtual reality game that's done some really cool you know, physical world, VR, real world integrations. But it's also now dropped in the mapping experience and actually completely expanded the game into a global AR experience. So another important point is the existing game, right? You, they didn't have to build it from scratch thinking about this. They just brought it in and added it. So it's a very powerful you know, way to make your platform better uh, and, and quicker. So A Realm, this is a game in pre-release, um, probably later this year, a planet scale RPG in, in the real world. It's created by Foundry6, and it's a startup in LA. And they had a, a developer with a big dream, which is to build a Niantic scale game. They really liked what they had seen with several of our games, and they wanted to take RPG to the next level. 
So they use not just uh, the, the map SDK, but they also use augmented reality to uh, find and collect you know, some aspects of the uh, content in the game. So again, a developer who, after they'd already gotten through part of the development, added this capability very, very quickly. And I think that's something we really want to emphasize. Next, I want to talk about metaversal deployment. So in 2021, uh, not coincidentally, uh, Eighth Wall launched this idea of metaversal deployment, which is cross-platform, web-based content that runs on your mobile phone, runs in glasses, runs in headsets, runs on your PC in virtual reality. So you can write once and deploy everywhere. So the news today is that it's available for mixed reality. So we have made it compatible with the MetaQuest Pro and MetaQuest 2, and probably all future mixed reality devices that are coming out. And you know, being able to write a game or write an application that can be used not just by people with AR, headset or AR headsets, MR headsets, and VR headsets, but also by the mobile phone developers, greatly expands, I think, the opportunity for your development to be consumed by more people. So, you know, as you know, this is uh, you know, very interesting, so what can we do with it? Well, meet Wall. So Wall is an owl, and it was developed uh, by Liquid City in conjunction with InWorld. And it is a combination of augmented reality and AI, and in particular, Gen AI. So there is an AI character uh, by InWorld that you can talk to about the forest. And it's very focused, I can tell you, on telling you about the forest. Um, and, but it's in, it's in uh, augmented reality, it works on the MetaQuest Pro, but it also works on your phone. So when you, when you get done with the conference here, you go out and have a, have a conversation with this owl who will have several opinions about how hard it is uh, to fly around very large trees. Um, in any case, it's also very cute, and it was developed very, very quickly, and it's cross-platform, and it's web-based, and it's audio interaction. It's, it's very, very cool. So uh, I want to thank the, the developers, Liquid City, and you know, the experience we've had working with InWorld has been very good. Next, I want to talk about shared AR. And uh, you know, we've, we've seen demos in the past, and I'm sure s several of you have you know, built, uh, built systems that do this. We want to make it easy for all developers to share experiences across users. And we're today announcing, literally right now, multiplayer in eighth wall. And what this allows is for a, a lobby room to be set up where you can have multiple players join and share an experience. And we handle all of the networking, we handle all of the cross-communication uh, cross between those players, and also the integration alignment between them. As you can see, with a simple QR code, you can join, uh, join a room. And the system can handle 100 simultaneously, up to 32 per room, and it's all handled in our cloud, not yours, so it's just another feature in 8th Wall. And so we believe this will enable a lot, a lot of much more in-depth experiences for 8th Wall developers, um, but it's just the beginning of what we're planning to do, because AR, shared AR is also going to be in ARDK3. So uh, the beta is coming for ARDK on June 14th, and it will include the first version of our shared AR in ARDK, and it's even more than what you saw with multiplayer. It is, in addition, AR, VPS, synchronized. So what it means is if two people localize in the VPS, we will be able to show exactly where they are relative to each other, and they can play high-performance, interactive experiences together. And more importantly, yeah, that's it. <laughs> This has been a huge amount of work by the, uh, by the Shared AR team, and, and you know, these demos are very hot off the press. Um, but the, the important thing is, you, know, we, you saw the lobby system that we built for 8th Wall. Well, this system, because of VPS, you don't even have to use a lobby system. If a user localizes to the same POI that you've set up, it can automatically join a system. You can simply point your camera at one of our VPS locations and jump into an experience with other players that are physically at that location and have jumped in as well. So the lobby is VPS, if you'd like to set it up that way. 
So it's very compatible with the rest of Unity. It's very similar to the netcode for game objects. So if you've developed with those, this will not be a surprise. And we're very excited about this co-localization experience because you know, right now, you can do it with an image target. You can do it with uh, VPS. And I think that it's going to change how people think about uh, you know, interacting uh, in the same place. Because one of our challenges with the system has been how do you get enough people in a place at a time uh, to have a good experience. And you can see another example of this um, on the back of your badge. Uh, there is um, a, a, a arcade uh, uh, QR card. Don't, don't do it right now. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, give it a try at some point later. And you can experience some of the lobby system and setup. Um, also, tomorrow, um, Ria Badia will be presenting on the other stage much more in-depth on how this works and how you can use it, and also how to think about it with respect to cross-platform, not just between devices, but also from web to Unity, because the shared AR will make it possible for you to actually share an experience across both of those uh, over time. Finally, I want to talk about a sort of vision for connecting AR everywhere. And uh, this is a bit of a hand wave, and it's where I think the world is going. But it, it comes from some learnings that we've had over time. You know, one of the things when you build a, uh, an experience right now in AR, you know, you're relatively tied to how many people are doing the same thing at the same time. You know, you can have an individual experience and it's okay, but you'd like group experiences to work. And in you know, VR and PC gaming, basically anybody in the world logs into a server, they're kind of in the same space. Well, in AR, especially in location-based IR like we care about, it's relatively rare to have enough density to do that. And I, I think back to July of 2016 when Pokemon Go was launched, we had half a billion people playing Pokemon Go. And so the overlap at any given moment, and sometimes was too many people at the same place at the same time, but how do, you, how do you get that experience when you're starting up? As, as, as developers here, many startups know, getting that kick-started network effects is a challenge. So could we combine AR in the physical world with VR? And so as you saw, we take the, our meshes pretty seriously. We think we can scan the world with high enough resolution that you could use that experience in virtual reality to allow one player or many other players to live in a VR version of that experience while you live in an AR version of that experience and be able to see and interact with these virtual players in the world right next to you. So think about the combination of AR, VR, and how that could potentially expand very quickly the number of people who can share an experience at the same time. That is the goal of shared AR, and that is the, you know, why I do what I do. And I'll just skip here to the end. At Niantic, we believe that AR everywhere, all at once, for everyone. Thank you.